Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk here. And uh, on the formation of complex organics, uh, materials or uh, molecules, comms from PAHs or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. It kind of goes along with the theme this morning about what are biosignatures, how do you make other molecules, can you make other molecules from the PAHs. And what I'm going to talk about, give you a little bit of background on the comms if you're not familiar with the term. Um, chemists view comms differently than astrobiologists and astronomers, just to point out. Uh, but for, in the astrobiology context, comms are organic molecules containing carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, possibly nitrogen, such as the aldehydes, uh, ketones, quinones, and stuff, um, which are carbon chains with functional groups attached to them, uh, which can be useful in prebiotic chemistry and the origins of life context. PAHs are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, if you're not familiar with them, I think we, they showed a couple of times this morning, are carbon hydrogen molecules with cyclic aromatic rings of carbon in there. They're important because uh, they're one of the most abundant sources of carbon in the universe. We find them all over the place, uh, pretty much. And in the ISM, the interstellar medium, the PAHs tend to be 50 to 100 carbon atoms in size. We also find PAHs within the solar system, but they're typically a lot smaller. We find them in meteorites, interplanetary dust particles, cometary particles and such. And they're usually about 24 atoms or smaller. Uh, aromatic molecules also make up, such as PAHs, components of the insoluble organic material, which, which we find in meteorites. The aromatic structures are also important in the biochemistry. A lot of our biochemistry are cyclic carbon structures or even aromatic structures. Uh, so what's interesting about the PAHs is, is what happens when they undergo energetic processing. We know they're in the ISM, they're large molecules. Uh, and so when the protocellular nebula forms or even in, in areas within our own solar system, you have high energetic particles going on. So what happens to the chemistry of PAHs? So, such as UV photolysis, high energy protons, and electrons. So that's where the basis of this kind of started. Uh, and it kind of goes to a bottom up or top down. We heard that term earlier this morning, but in this term it's like a bottom up synthesis or a top down synthesis. Are the organics in the solar system formed from smaller molecules combining together, or larger molecules from the ISM getting processed down to smaller molecules? So we wanted to investigate that. And so we did some experiments uh, called ICE, or Investigation of Carbon and Evolution Experiments. And what we did was we took two PAHs, chlorine, which is a 24 carbon atom, very compact pH structure, isovalanthrene, I'm going to call it IVA just for short, which is a 34 carbon atom uh, pH. And what we did was we deposited them as thin films on, a salt, on salt windows. And then we took them uh, to the, uh, and exposed them to UV, pro, uh, UV photons, pro, protons, and electrons. Uh, and then while we were doing that, we did pre and post infrared uh, spectroscopy measurements. And we, the chamber itself had a RGA on it, a residual gas analyzer to see what uh, species were given off during irradiation and after irradiation. We did the samples, uh, both single radiation sources and in combination to see if a combination radiation had an effect versus individual radiation sources. And then we also did uh, the samples with um, a layer of ice on them to see if that impact, how that impacted the chemistry. We did the experiments at the Combined Environmental Effects Facility at the Marshall Space Flight Center in uh, Huntsville, Alabama. It's not necessarily set up for these type of experiments, so we're doing a proof of concept with it. It's actually set up to expose satellites to solar wind. So we're using the solar wind in this instance to do our chemistry. You have a proton accelerator going into this vacuum chamber, as well as a high energy electron accelerator and the UV light source. So we did, here's the energies we use. We use about 700 keV proton, uh, 90 keV electrons. The UV only experiments were done at NASA Ames in our laboratory with a hydrogen discharge lamp using 10.2 eV. We try to match the fluence as much as possible between the samples. Here's some visual results of what happened to the samples. This is a, the sample holder that we made for the chamber. It was a huge chamber, but um, we did duplicate samples, corning at top, the isovalanthrene or IVA at the bottom. You can actually see color changes going on with the chlorinine. It's a translucent material. It actually changed color upon bombardment. The blue color that you're seeing here is actually color centers developed in the salt windows when we were irradiating. Uh, 
a little bit more on the visual results. A lot of pHs fluoresce when you put them under UV light. And here's our control sample with no, no irradiation going on. Uh, and you can see it fluoresces great. Uh, the other samples, they had no water layer, water ice layer on them, not so much. They got pretty much, this is telling us we're destroying the aromatic structure, we're, just doing, we're actually changing it, altering it, and seeing what's going on. Uh, shown here is the RGA results. And you have the mass going from 1 to 100 uh, AMU. The <coughs> y-axis is pressure in a, log in a logarithmic scale. And there's certain, there are several time points going on here. The, before cool down, just to give you an idea of what the background looked like in the chamber. Um, after cool down, when we started the electron gun, this is our electron irradiation experiments, overnight and when we started warming up. So let's go through them in a second. Let's get back to, I'll give it one second to go through the cycle. And here is the background right here. It has a little bit of background contamination. After cool down, it's a little bit less intense. We start the electron gun, we start seeing a little bit more. Uh, even overnight, and then when we get to uh, warm up, we get all this other electron, uh, other material showing up. And what that actually looks like, again, here's a stack plot uh, from 10 to 100 uh, mass units. We've got the protons, the electrons, and, com and combined set. Protons in the red here, electrons black, blue and green for the combined. Again, these are both large PAHs. Corning itself is about 300 AMU. Um, Isovalanthrene is another 120 AMU above that. And so the fact, and when you, if you put a pH in a mass spectrometer, you don't necessarily get these, large, these small fragments that we're seeing here. And what you see here is, one, you see a distinct pattern difference between the protons and electrons. If you look at the patterns you're seeing, you're seeing a C1, a carbon, one carbon, two carbon, three carbon, up to about seven carbon chains in length. Uh, the protons seem to stop around the three to four carbon chain length. You also see it seems like it's stripping off hydrogens one at a time before you get to some peaks. And the, right now the, pro, the combination looks just like a combined proton and electron spectrum. We need to do some more work on that to see if there's actually a difference with the combined radiation. Um, pointing out a couple of peaks, the 69 peak was unusual because we're still trying to figure out what's going on. And then we've got uh, a 26 peak here in the C2 area that we're going to look at. When we put a water ice layer on it, and you can actually visually see the water ice layer, our fragmentation pattern didn't really change that much. The, the main peaks, the main fragmentation peaks didn't change. Um, but it did kind of, uh, it kind of stop these uh, individual hydrogens being stripped off. The main fragments were still, were still there. Just to show you one interesting thing between the, another interesting thing between the electron and proton, Here's right before the start of the electron gun. When we started the electron gun, we see a order of magnitude increase in that 69 peak and that 26 peak. 26 peak is characteristic of acetylene. And PAH is when they get really energetic, like to give off a C2H group, acetylene hyper group. We don't see that so much with the proton. The only time we give off these peaks is when we start warming up the sample, so after the irradiation. So the electrons seem to be sputtering the stuff off as well as uh, producing it. Um, and then the combination is, again, kind of a mix between the electron and proton. Now, there's a lot going on in this slide, but I'll try to, it's the, it's the, pre, the pre and post uh, infrared spectra. And what you're seeing here are different spectra. We took the infrared spectra of the irradiated sample and subtracted off the uh, pre-irradiated sample. So the, neutral, the unaltered sample subtracted from the altered samples. And this is for coronine. The purple here is the UV results, the black is the electron bombardment, the red is the proton bombardment, and the blue is the combined. A couple of things to point out. Uh, you see a bump kind of uh, pointing, coming out around eight to 10 microns in the UV. You see a couple of bu uh, bumps coming out between five and a half and 15 microns in the electron and proton as well as combination. We do see a couple of new bands that are very small features in the combined that we don't see in the other ones that we've got to investigate. And we we're kind of comparing this bottom uh, color that you see here actually matches up to different hydrogenation states of a pH, theoretically, that we've taken off of our PAW database. And so it looks like we're hydrogenating as well as doing some other things to it. But the interesting thing here, and you'll have a talk on this in a little bit, are these broad features that we're seeing kind of uh, correlate 
with the plateaus that you see in the unidentified infrared emission bands or the PAW bands that we see in the, in the infrared all over the place. So is that an indication that they're processed PAWs? I don't know. We've got to do a lot more work. Focusing in on the CH stretch, here's isovalanthrene, here's coronine. What you can see is the CH stretch, the aromatic group in the aliphatic. The aliphatics grow upon, which again is the indication of hydrogenation, um, in the proton and electron in the combined versus the UV. But the electrons were unique in that they created this 3.03 micron feature. We didn't see that in the protons. That's kind of a characteristic of a CH stretching group off of a C triple bond C or maybe a, a acetylene. These were taken at room temperature and room pressure so it couldn't be acetylene gas by itself. So it has to be a functional group like that attached to the PAH. So what we kind of figure is going on is that we're taking the PA and actually it's taking the PAH, hitting it with protons and electrons, creating all these interesting structures such as acetylene uh, and other groups. If you start going digging through the mass spectra, you see a lot of complicated stuff going on. Uh, so we're processing the PAH, is creating all these other organics from it, from a top-down approach versus a bottom-up approach. But again, these are preliminary. We're going to uh, do a lot more work, uh, and I'll end on that on the conclusions a little bit is that the radiation processing does fragment the PAHs, modifies the chemistry of the PAHs, giving you a whole complex mixture of smaller molecules. Um, there is a difference between the electron and proton uh, and UV radiations. We are going to, this is a mock-up of our new system that we're going to come on, it's called ICE, that we're starting in July. We're going to be able to do in situ measurements while we're irradiating with Raman spectroscopy uh, IR spectroscopy and uh, the RGA. So hopefully, and just I would like to uh, thank the organizers again and thank our funding agencies. So well, and with that, I'll hopefully answer any questions. Uh, we have time probably for like two or three questions. That's an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure. Well, on, the, on the electron bombardment, our, our new setup is going to have uh, a, a electron guns capable of doing this. This was a proof of concept, so we can only do one point. And so we'd like to go back and, and do the measurements where we can actually change the energies and change the fluences and see which parameters are most important. Uh, I've got a theory on the electron one, which, one's, which energy level is going to be the biggest one, but I'm not sure. I'm, you know. Uh, we can go back and look. So yeah, so it's. I don't huh? think it's not, it's not quite like okay. What I mean is energy absorbed on the x axis. Oh. If you, have a, if you have equal amounts of energy absorbed, would you get the same products, or would you not get the same? That's I don't know. I have to I, I have to go change that in there. I'm, it's hard. To, it's hard to measure energy absorbed sometimes. Yeah. No. No. And this is a, kind of a new area for us as well. And so I'm learning a lot about the different ways to look at the data. I'll, I'll plot the data one way, go back and say, hey, wait a minute, but, you know. That's a good idea. I gotta go back and try this one now. So. <laughs> Another quick question. Uh, do you have any interest in characterizing the, the products, breakdown products of this? For example, do you think that maybe you can get something like nuclear bases from breaking down these pHs? I, um, that's a good question, and I'm trying to figure out. Uh, the mass spectra is a complex mixture right now. I'm really curious what we're going to see when we do these experiments. We can do them in situ and combine the infrared, the Raman, and the mass spec. And especially doing it with the pH by itself and the pH with water ice and pH with different things in there. I'm really curious what kind of chemistry you're going. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if you start changing stuff around. We know we, we, know we, and we do stuff with the UV and organic mixtures in a water ice and we make uh, nuclear bases and stuff like that. This is coming from the top down again, so I wouldn't be surprised, but I, I don't know. I have to do the experiments and find out. I'm excited by getting this stuff up and running and doing it. So, yeah. Let's thank my speaker again, and we're going to um, move on to the second invited.